Therefore, it is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is for the Premier. As we all know, COVID cases are up in Ontario. About a month ago, the Premier asked for some advice as to the, the use of, of mandatory vaccine policies for schools and hospitals, but of course, he got that advice and then flat out refused to take it. Instead, he listens to anti-vaxxers. In long-term care, 98% of staff have had their first shot. 95% are fully vaccinated, which shows, Speaker, that this policy, in fact, works. Why will this Premier not guarantee the same level of protection for patients and students and stop coddling anti-vaxxers? Respond, the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, because of the great work that the CEOs and the public health and, and the frontline health care workers, that's the reason we're at 98 per cent of health care workers. But we also have to keep in mind the backlog surgeries, the diagnostics, the cancer screenings. That's what we have to keep in mind. That's the reason we sent out a letter to all the hospitals to get a better gauge on what's going on. But I'm so proud of our frontline health care workers, the job they've been doing throughout the pandemic, and I'm so proud that they've hit 98 per cent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the science table advised the uh, government this, and I quote, requiring that health care workers be vaccinated is evidence-based and protects the public. Long-term care residents and staff are safer because of that mandate. Newborns in hospitals should be safe too, Speaker. Fans at Raptors game uh, games need a vaccine, but the Premier doesn't think workers and schools and hospitals should have it. How can the Premier ignore the best scientific advice for a mandatory vaccine policy and leave patients, students, and staff at hospitals and schools at risk? And to reply, Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, protecting the health and well-being of all Ontarians has been our primary objective since this pandemic began. That applies to everyone. We appreciate that most of our health care workers and uh, workers in schools have already been vaccinated. We're very grateful for that. But the other reality is that in addition to protecting people from COVID, we also have thousands and thousands of people who have been waiting for over a year to have necessary surgeries done, hip and knee replacements, cataract surgeries, and other necessary surgeries. We need to make sure that we have the health human resources available in order to do that so that people can be well, they can be free from pain, they can go back to work, they can go back and enjoy the activities they want to enjoy. So we, this is not an easy determination to make. We have to weigh on a basis of an assessment of risk what is Response. more dangerous, to require vaccination or to give up on all of those other people that need our help. We are not going to give up on them. Good Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the bottom line is that vaccine mandates work. They protect staff and they protect the public. The TDSB had minimal, minimal disruption with their mandate. Many hospitals, the, uh, the uh, University Hospital Network, for example, already have mandates for vaccines in, as a policy in the hospitals. They know what this Premier refuses to acknowledge, that it is the best way to protect patients and staff. When is the Premier going to stop listening to anti-vaxxers, stop coddling that, seg that segment of, uh, of the population and start listening to the advice of the science table and other experts who clearly say it is absolutely the right thing to do to have a mandate for vaccines in hospitals and schools. The Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't know what the Leader of the Opposition or who, who she's trying to convince. I've been up there for 20 months, every single day, promoting people getting vaccinations. As the Leader of the Opposition, is, I, I don't even know where she is. And we're going to continue making sure we encourage people, all frontline health care workers, to get vaccinated. We're going to make sure all education workers get vaccinated. We're out there every single day promoting it. We allow the, the hospitals to have the flexibility because what is good for downtown hospitals isn't necessarily good for far northern rural hospitals 
that need more health care workers. We're giving them the flexibility because the difference between us and the NDP and the Liberals, we believe the hospitals are experts. They know what they're doing. That's why we gave them the flexibility. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks so much, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. This morning, Alberta is signing a $10 a day childcare deal with the federal government. The Premier may not know it, but in fact, families are struggling to make ends meet these days. Cost of living is up, rent is up, the price of milk is up. Ontario families need quality, affordable childcare. So the question to this Premier is, why is he so unwilling to cut a deal for $10 a day child care for Ontario families. And to reply on behalf of the government, the Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, this Premier and our government has invested every single year $2 billion to help deliver quality child care, make it more affordable, given that the former Liberal government increased child care costs under the former Liberals by 40 per cent over the national average. The second province with the most expensive child care in Canada was Ontario under the former Liberals. The worst was the New Democratic province of BC. We know we can do better than the NDP and Liberal. We know we can set a higher standard. We also know the federal government needs to pay a fair share. They contribute 2.5 per cent of Ontario's contribution of child care. They could do much, much more, Speaker, and we know and we believe in a good deal is on the horizon, but it requires the federal government to accept three core principles. The first is flexibility. The second is the respect for all parents, all families deserve support from this federal government. And the third is sustainability. So we do not see a program that is viable for five years and then declines in year six, fees hike, and parents ultimately pay the price. We want a long-term commitment that is gonna benefit all families. That's what we're fighting for at that negotiation. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the federal minister responsible said this, and I quote, we actually haven't received any numbers from the government of Ontario. Every other province has managed to send us an action plan from which we've been able to have negotiations. But quite frankly, we're still waiting for Ontario. Parents need some breathing room. They can't wait forever. The cost of childcare, first under the Liberal government and now under this PC government here in Ontario, is the highest in the country. The fees, in some cases, can be more than the cost of a mortgage speaker. So why doesn't this Premier want to make life just a little more affordable for families with children by providing them with $10 a day childcare, like the rest of the country has been able to do? Mr. Education. Well, thank you, Speaker. In fact, the Premier does want to do that. It's why in his first budget, he introduced a child care tax cut to reduce fees. And I will remind the member opposite you voted against that. So did the Liberals, by the way, in each successive budget. In the last budget, we enriched that tax credit to provide roughly $1,500 per child in savings. Now, we recognize that in itself is not going to make child care affordable, which is why we expect the feds to pay their fair share. 2.5 percent is clearly insufficient. But, Speaker, what we're doing on this side, and I would expect all members to unify behind our government, is that there's a, there's a full-day kindergarten program in Ontario for four and five-year-olds. 260,000 kids are getting full subsidies by the provincial taxpayer. Why is it that the New Democrats and Liberals do not agree with the premise that the federal Liberal government should pay their fair share and support Ontario, who has one of the most mature programs of childcare in the nation? We're proud of that. We know there's more to do. We're going to continue to advance flexibility, sustainability, and a program that supports every mom, every father, every mom and dad in the province of Ontario. And the final supplementary. Speaker, tax credits don't build affordable, quality childcare spaces for families in this province. This government, this government just doesn't get what families are going through. In fact, their low-wage policies are hurting all Ontarians. High childcare fees are squeezing families. The cost can be more than a mortgage, as I've already mentioned. Women who have been hit hard by this pandemic need affordable, quality, reliable child care to get back to work. Afford affordable child care, Speaker, is not just good for families. It's good for the economy as well. And so the question to this Premier is, why is he so unwilling to get a deal for Ontario families, to make affordable child care a reality here? Give those families a break because the life the cost of living is going up Order. and they need reliable affordable child care why will he not provide it once again the minister of education 
Deputy Speaker, we are working hard to get a good deal. And if I could uh, cite the Ontario uh, Daycare Operators of Ontario Executive Director, who said just days ago, quote, the wrong deal for Ontario could leave families with fewer licensed childcare spaces and paying much, much more for them in the context of uh, supporting Ontario's independent licensed uh, child care operators who are encouraging the province to take the time to negotiate this with the federal government and get it right. Now, Mr. Speaker, we want a deal. We've been at the table for months. The member opposite may, may recall a federal election called by the federal Liberal government themselves impeded our ability to conclude it. But the Premier and this progressive Conservative government believes at our core that the federal Liberals can give this province a better deal with long-term sustainable investments that parents deserve. We do not want to sign a deal that may be a good headline on day one and lead to higher prices in year five. We want something that is sustainable, that is enduring, and that Spons? respects the interests of all families, of all parents, and how best they choose to raise their kids. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto, Dan Ford. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. This weekend, the Toronto Star revealed that the Ford government has approved eight mining exploration permits. These permits will allow companies to drill for gold on the area that the Grassy Narrows First Nation has declared as an Indigenous protected area. But the government didn't notify Grassy Narrows nor consult with them to get consent. Speaker, did the minister not realize that this was Grassy Narrows territory when he issued the permits? And how could that possibly have been missed? Reply on behalf of the government, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank, Thank you very much for that question. So it gives me an opportunity to, to clarify some things. The exploration activity is not actually mining activity. It is Mining is a, a multi-step process that we have to go through, and it begins with the exploration permit. But an exploration permit does not allow the exploration company to engage in mine development, construction, or production of the mine. It is a multi-year process that we have to go through, and Ontario is committed to the success of First Nations and seeks to work proactively with First Nations, including ANA, to achieve positive outcomes including healthy communities, good jobs, and economic prosperity. Mining claim registrations in the area can likely be attributed to an increase in mineral commodity prices, absolutely. But the overwhelming majority of mining claim registrations Response? and exploration projects do not result in an operating mine. I'll have more to say in the supplementary. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, again to the Minister. That was one of the weakest first answers I've ever heard. Anyway, the people of Grassy Narrows have lived through decades of pain with basic human rights denied and ignored by successive Liberal and Conservative governments. Now the Ford government is plowing ahead to do even more damage. Issuing these permits is a violation of the Mining Act and Section 35 of the Constitution, the duty to consult. Grassy Narrows says the mining exploration will compound the harm that mercury and clear-cut logging have already done to their land and their people, and that harm has been considerable. You know that, Speaker. Speaker, will the minister cancel these permits immediately and withdraw mining and clear-cut logging from Grassy Narrows territory? The end of reply, the parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The ministry has worked in good faith with the a with ANA and their neighbours to identify community views and positions on the no harvest area and seek a balanced path forward that can be applied through the next decade with the Whiskey Jack Forest Management Plan. The Crown takes its duty to consult with Aboriginal communities very seriously. We'll continue to consult with all First Nations on mining exploration and development activities where such activities have the potential to adversely affect a community's established or credibly asserted Aboriginal or treaty rights. We are committed to satisfying this constitutional obligation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as Ontario begins to exit the roadmap to reopen, we are also proud of our school community that has continually been kept safe and learning since the start of this school year. Beyond the measures that this government has taken, we know that many students are racialized or from lower income families are facing barriers to success in the classroom. 
Studies have found that students that are racialized, indigenous, or from lower-income families are disproportionately affected by academic streaming in secondary schools. Can the Minister of Education tell this House what steps the government has taken to ensure that barriers are removed for all students to achieve their fullest potential? Thank you. Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for Brantford Brand for his question and the advocacy from so many families in this province to remove the barriers uh, that many young people uh, face every single day, particularly racialized and black and indigenous children in Ontario. Uh, our government and our premier have made a commitment to um, dismantle those barriers, to take them on with a plan that is decisive, that includes the end of streaming for grade nine children. We started in grade nine with math this past September, transformational and helping to create pathways for young people to pursue their full potential, including in the skilled trades in college university, as we hope to instill greater emphasis on life and job skills, particularly the new math curriculum that deals with financial literacy and coding and the skill sets that young people need to succeed. That is the same vision we have for all of the curriculum we're teaching children, which is why we were proud last week to confirm Response. that the province will end streaming in Ontario for grade nine right across all grades with the aim of lifting up the performance of all children and helping them succeed in this province. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for his response. It is great to see that Ontario students are being given an equal chance to succeed in math something that the former government did not do for thousands of Ontario students. Mr. Speaker, beyond the importance of mathematics, we know that barriers do not stop at one course. Courses in science, geography, and English are still being streamed into academic and applied streams. Can the Minister of Education update this House on how he plans to ensure all students in grade nine are given a fair chance at success in the classroom? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, indeed, uh, we, there's more work to do to help uh, end some of the barriers that are impeding young people's performance and success in Ontario, particularly when it looks at the disproportionality uh, that children who are black, for example, were being streamed into applied courses two or three times the rate of other children in Ontario. Quite obviously, there is a systemic problem we must confront. And I'm proud as a progressive conservative to take this challenge on, to focus on it over the past many years with an aim of providing a centralized path to success for all kids, including in a new de-streamed courses for science, grade nine science, for English, for geography. These are foundational skills which will be modernized for next September. Mr. Speaker, we know the disproportionality exists. It's why the government took action last year to end streaming. It's why this government, for the first time in the history of Ontario, brought in a supervisor in Peel Region due to Spons. racism. We're going to continue to confront racism in all of its forms and work hard to give every student a pathway to success in Ontario. The next question, the member for University of Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. For four months now, seniors and kids have not had access to OHIP-covered eye care in Ontario. Seniors like David Allgood, a resident in my riding of University of Rosedale. In October, David's regular eye exam was cancelled because the Ford government refused to negotiate with optometrists. Just a few days later, David started experiencing vision problems, which impacted his ability to read, write and drive. David pleaded with his optometrist for a visit but was declined and was referred to the emergency room. David is angry that the Ford government put his eyesight at risk, and he's angry the government is promoting unnecessary and costly visits to the ER. This is my question. Why is the government further burdening hospital emergency rooms when they could just pay optometrists a fair price for their services? <laughs> Minister of Health. Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question because it gives me the opportunity to uh, correct some inaccuracies that are out there right now. First is that the government of Ontario has never referred, re refused to pay OHIP services for children and for seniors. We are ready, willing and able to provide those services, but the fact of the matter is that the Ontario Association of Optometrists is not prepared to do so. 
We went to the table with them to meet for mediation. They disagreed with uh, some of the, uh, uh, the ways to proceed, but we decided to uh, move ahead in any event. And we uh, did receive a letter that asked why we weren't providing the services. The answer is we are ready to. We are urging the Ontario Ops, uh, Association of Optometrists to come back to the table. We want to reach a deal with them. We know they've been treated badly by other governments. Response? We want to fix that. And I'll speak in my supplement about what we are prepared to do. A supplementary question. I thank you. Back to the Minister of Health. David later learned he had a hole in his retina which, left untreated, could cause permanent blindness. And David is just one of the thousands of people in Ontario who've had their eyesight put at risk because of this government's failure to negotiate in good faith. For decades now, successive governments have failed to increase OHIP funding to cover the cost of basic services like eye exams for children and seniors. And we knew this situation was coming and it could have been prevented. In fact, I sent a letter to the Minister of Health over a year ago urging the Minister to engage in dialogue with optometrists so service wouldn't be restricted. This is my question. When will this government stop putting Ontarians' help? and eyesight at risk and return to the negotiating table to reach a fair deal. Minister of Health. Thank you. In fact, we uh, take the health and well-being of every single Ontarian to be very important, and we are prepared to sit down at the table with the Ontario Association of Optometrists. We've already paid because of the fact that they haven't had an agreement since 2011. We've already paid $39 million into their accounts to cover what they would have received had they been paid at the same rate of physicians for the last decade. That is what the association asked for. We also agreed to go into mediation with them, which is what the association asked for. We agreed to the mediator that they asked for. We also have agreed that we would pay to start 8.48% increase going forward, but retroactive to April 1st, recognizing, again, that they wanted to be paid at the same level that physicians would have been paid. And we are prepared to set up a working group to discuss the issues with respect to overhead that the association has asked us Response. to do. We are ready to do that today if the Ontario Association of Optometrists will come back to the table. That's all we're asking them to do, and we're ready to go. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Questions for the Premier. Speaker, Health Canada is expected to announce the approval of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for children aged 5 to 11 within the next two weeks. This is good news because one in five cases are those school-aged children here in Ontario. And we know that immunization against COVID-19 will not only protect children from the Delta variant, but their families and those around them as well. And we also know that universal vaccinations have protected children and their families for decades here in Ontario. So, Speaker, through you, will the Premier protect our children and their families by making COVID-19 vaccinations universal in schools like we've done for so many other vaccines in this province? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to the member for the question. What we are doing is uh, finalizing our plan for the vaccination of children aged 5 to 11. This is something that each and every public health unit has been asked to do. They are ready to go. As soon as the approval from Health Canada comes forward, we will be ready to start those vaccinations. The vaccination plan in every different region will look different, but the, it's fair to say that many of the vaccination clinics will be done in schools, perhaps not during school hours, but we also have a vaccination line for people to call. If they have questions about vaccinating their children, they can call the children's hospitals, speak to a specialist, make sure it's safe for their children, and we are receiving a, a large number of calls to those clinics, and we anticipate that most parents will move forward with having their child vaccinated. They recognize that that's the healthy and safe thing to do. The supplementary question. Well, well Speaker, the government can start today by adding those over 12 to the Immunization of School Pupils Act, because we've had those vaccines approved for months and months now. So we've imp implemented universal vaccinations for polio, mumps, measles, rubella, meningitis, whooping cough, and chickenpox. That system has been in place for decades, and it's actually helped schools and public health units manage infectious diseases and outbreaks. It's been there for decades. It's a tool that's ready to go. 
The Ontario Public School Boards Association, Toronto District School Board, the Ottawa District School Board, public health experts have all called for the government to make these vaccines part of that universal list. And it's a reasonable thing for families to expect that. So, Speaker, why is the Premier not listening to parents and experts Question. and schools who are calling on this government to ensure kids 5 to 11 are vaccinated against COVID-19 in order to keep them safe? Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, our government has been taking every step possible to keep everyone safe in Ontario, from children to seniors and everyone else in between. As of today, we have 88.7 per cent of our population aged 12 and over having received one dose of the vaccine and 85.6 per cent receiving two doses. That's one of the highest rates, not just in Canada, but in the world. And we're going to continue to do that. We have a last mile strategy that we're using where we have go back, go vax buses going to areas we have a large numbers of people who are unvaccinated we're still having the clinics we're still doing it through primary care and we'll continue to do that with the children as well currently right now we have uh, 18 to 29 79.2 percent have been fully vaccinated 12 to 17 year olds 80.1 percent some of that is because some of the children that were 11 turning 12 didn't receive the notification that they could move forward until more recently but our numbers continue to go up and we're going to get everybody vaccinated Response. in ontario that wants to be vaccinated Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the President of the Treasury Board. In my writing of Niagara West, we've seen that the pandemic has revealed how Ontario's programs and frontline services need to be more reliable, more accessible, and convenient. We saw that the last government said no to reducing red tape, no to, re to supporting small businesses, and frankly, no to supporting the people of this province. But my constituents want to know what this government is doing to make services more accessible, reduce red tape, and simplify policies for all Ontarians. My constituents have long demanded simpler, faster, and better services, but never more so than during a pandemic. Speaker, my question through you to the Minister of the, to the President of the Treasury Board, how will the Minister advance our public services and ensure that Ontarians are receiving these services in a rapid fashion? And to reply, the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for Niagara West uh, for that excellent question. Uh, with more and more people accessing digital services, we can't afford to be an offline government in an online world. The government is listening to Ontarians and is exploring of how programs and services can be improved. We've worked hard to, to cut red tape, reduce uh, inefficiencies, and create a better experience for the people of Ontario. While this work has preceded uh, the pandemic COVID-19 has meant, we had to accelerate and innovate uh, our approach to moving Ontario onwards. Mr. Speaker, our government launched the $500 million Ontario Onwards Acceleration Fund to support this work. The fund will reinvest in public services and will accelerate transformation across government by supporting innovative ideas and providing opportunities to pilot new technologies. Mr. Speaker, we are undertaking an across-the-board modernization of an entire government. We are moving Ontario onwards. And the supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker, to the Minister through you. And, and I have to say, I've heard from many constituents who appreciate that they don't need to spend as much time waiting in line for approvals. They don't need to spend as much time uh, waiting in line at Service Ontario. But there are indeed uh, ways that the government has cut red tape and ensured that we're able to access government services in a rapid fashion. But, Speaker, there is more that we can do. There's more that we can do. And I want to hear a little bit more from the Minister about what Ontario is doing to encourage and accelerate transformation across government, uh, support innov innovative ideas, and also provide opportunities to pilot new technologies. And I'm also wondering how uh, the government plans to fund innovation in this province. Again, the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the, the member again for that very important question. The world has changed and our government must change with it. The new Ontario Acceleration Fund will help with the implementation of projects uh, that will make a difference in how people and businesses experience services in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, everyone will benefit from a more efficient government. For example, a small business owner can register for licenses online and permits online and even open their accounts online. Or Ontario farmers 
can choose to renew a farm vehicle online rather than or instead of visiting a Service Ontario location in person. Mr. Speaker, we are expanding the range of programs and services available online, simplifying the government's role in people's lives and their businesses. We're going to be putting people at the centre of everything we do and continue to reinvest in our services and accelerate transformation across government. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, back in March, the Premier told the people of Brampton, uh, and I'll quote, we're building a hospital. It's going to be a beautiful, state-of-the-art hospital, end quote. The problem for Brampton, though, Speaker, was that the Premier hasn't made the investments necessary to bring a new hospital to our community, and he certainly hasn't put any shovels in the ground either. Now, folks in Brampton are once again raising concerns that this over-promised and under-delivered plan isn't even going to meet the needs of our growing city. We learned last week that we may be only getting 250 beds over seven years, well short of the 850 beds that the city requested when they declared a health care emergency in Brampton. So, Speaker, my question again through you to the Premier is, when is this Conservative government going to stop playing political games with our community and finally commit to a standalone, brand-new hospital for the people of Brampton? Thank you. Minister of Health to respond. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Our government has made a commitment to the people of Brampton. We've been hearing for a long period of time about how this rapidly growing community needs more hospital development. We've made the uh, agreement to revitalize the existing hospital, to create an emergency department there, to create an acute care centre there, and to build it up into a full-grown hospital. That is a commitment we have made, and that is a commitment that we are going to keep. Here, 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 here. Supplementary question. Speaker, families in Brampton are sick of Liberals and Conservatives using our community as election pawns. Decades of broken promises, underfunding and inaction from both Liberal and Conservative governments have had real consequences for the people of Brampton. Our only hospital is routinely over capacity. People leave our community to get health care services. Surgeries are delayed, exceptionally long wait times, and health care staff that are run off their feet. Speaker. And our city only receives uh, receives $1,000 less per capita in health care funding. Speaker. My heart breaks thinking of what our community goes through, and it's unfair, and the people of Brampton deserve so much better. Speaker. We deserve a full-service hospital, full stop. We need more than empty promises from this government, Speaker. We need shovels in the ground, and we need beds that keep up with the growing demand in Question. our community. Speaker, when is Brampton going to get the new hospital our community deserves and that we have been promised? Mr. Hill. Well, the member is absolutely right. The people of Brampton do deserve better, and they're going to get better. But let me just quote what the uh, mayor of Brampton, uh, Mr. Patrick Brown, recently said. Brampton got nothing for two decades. For 20 years, we were ignored despite having institutionalized hallway medicine. Frankly, this should have been done 15 years ago. We're getting a $1 billion, the largest investment in health care in our city's history. This is a significant step forward. This is progress, and I don't think there is any mayor in Canada that would not be elated with a $1 billion investment in their community. Speaker, the opposition party should listen to what Mayor Brown said when he encouraged people not to play politics with a new hospital. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thanks, Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. On August 27, 2020, the minister approved an MZO request to fast-track the building of a 1 million square foot industrial warehouse in the village of Lair in my riding of Cambridge. The initial public consultation on rezoning the area was done in 2012, completed six years ago, and the consultation was done for a different use of the land altogether, not for one big, massive industrial facility. Despite the fact that consultation was done that long ago for a different facility, and the user of the new facility remains a secret mystery, and Blair residents are against the project, and Six Nations were not consulted on the development, the minister approved the project anyway. My question for the minister is, why did he approve the MZL? 
To reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, thanks, Speaker, and I want to thank uh, the member for the question. Uh, our government has been very clear on all minister zoning orders on non-provincially owned land. It comes at the request of the municipality. It's been very clear that the City of Cambridge has requested uh, this order. Uh, I've wrote the mayor uh, and asked specifically from a council perspective, had they done their due diligence in terms of consultation with the local community? The city came back and again confirmed not only that they had done their due diligence, but that they also reaffirmed that they requested a minister zoning order. Uh, pre uh, Speaker, we've been very clear with the City of Cambridge, with the local council on this project. We expect that they do their due diligence before they ask for this order. Thank you. And a supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Well, despite this government's claims that it is for the people, it isn't listening to local voices when it comes to big government programs. Instead, hiding behind the decisions of local councils who are going rogue and not representing their constituents. Whether it is approving the construction of the largest wind farm in Ontario, the Nation Rise Wind Farm in Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry, or allowing Cambridge City Council to move forward with a request for a drug injection site, and now hammering through this MZO order, all against the will of local residents. This government is showing contempt for the province's own consultation rules and residents of local communities. What assurances are in place to hold municipal councils in check when they go rogue on their constituents and try to hammer ahead with programs against the will of their residents? Minister of Municipal Affairs. Again, in terms of uh, this minister's zoning order in this council, I'm not going to speak to those other two matters that uh, the member brings up because they have nothing to do with the minister's zoning order in Cambridge. Uh, we've communicated to um, the mayor and the council. We've been crystal clear. Uh, if the community does not do the Indigenous consultation, I will revoke the MZO. I've written two letters to the mayor and indicated that it's our expectation that they're going to do these consultations, that they're going to have these discussions. I've wrote them once, I've wrote them again, and I've given them a deadline. They've got to move forward with those consultations or it'll be revoked, plain and simple. Thank you. The next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Speaker, as you know, Ontario is facing a shortage of nurses. In my riding, uh, Muskoka Algonquin Healthcare, West Perry Sound Health Centre, and local long term care facilities all struggle to find enough nurses. There was a shortage of nurses before the pandemic, but COVID 19 has only made the shortage worse. So, Mr. Speaker, can the Minister tell us? What tangible actions the minister has taken to address the nursing shortage in Ontario, and will the minister commit to creating more nursing spots and programs by the 2022 academic year? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka, for that important question. This past year, the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated how vital nurses are to our health care system. Mr. Speaker, our government has taken the necessary steps to address the nursing shortage in Ontario. Specifically, in my ministry, we have worked in collaboration with colleges and universities to create programs to maintain excellence in nursing education while also expanding choices for students. Last month, our government said yes to new standalone four-year Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree programs at both Georgian College and St. Lawrence College. These programs are in addition to the 15 universities and 22 colleges offering bachelorette nursing programs in collaborative partnerships. By allowing both colleges and universities to have standalone degrees, our government is increasing choice and reducing barriers to access high quality local education for our students. This is a bold and progressive move Response. under our government that will provide our students the opportunity to complete a highly sought after degree close to home and ultimately keep the talent in local communities to help address any skills shortages. Question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. It's great to hear our government is actively taking steps to address the nursing shortage and responds to the needs of our health care system. Mr. Speaker, when we consider the importance of nurses, we must also take into account the needs of the long-term care sector. Our government is mandating increased care in long-term care, and that seems to me will require even more nurses. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister. 
What is our government doing to support the addition of nurses to long-term care homes? And what is our government doing to support the upskilling of nurses and personal support workers? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member for that question. I was pleased to join the Minister of Long-Term Care in announcing our government's investment of nearly $35 million to increase enrollment in nursing education programs. This investment will enable Ontario's publicly assisted colleges and universities to accept an additional 1,130 practical nursing diploma students, as well as 870 Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree students for the September 2021 and January 2022 intakes. Increasing enrollment in nursing education programs is progress in ensuring that Ontario's health care system has the highly qualified staff needed to provide world-class care for Ontarians and our loved ones. Just last week, we joined the Minister of Long-Term Care to announce two innovative programs, the Bridging Education Grant in Nursing and the Nursing Program Transformation in Ontario Colleges, to increase access to nursing programs at publicly assisted colleges. Our government will Fonts. continue to say yes to our partners to provide students with the education and skills they need for rewarding careers that fuel a responsive and highly skilled labour market. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. In 2018, this Conservative government legislated a massive loophole in rent control rules in Ontario. For tenants living in newly built apartments, there is absolutely no limit to how much their landlords can increase their rent by. Speaker, I recently heard from Rasool, a constituent in my riding of Toronto Centre. He lives with his family in a new condo in the church in Wellesley Village. Last month, Rasool received notice from his landlord that his rent would be going up by 23 per cent, which is more than $400 a month, Speaker. Rahul and his family want to know when this government will finally help young families like his and restore rent control for all Ontarians. Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, thanks, Speaker. Um, I want to thank the member for the question. We were clear in the fall economic statement in 2018. We were going to commit, as we did during the election, uh, to protecting tenants uh, in rent control buildings. We made a decision uh, that has resulted in the most purpose-built rental construction in our province since 1992. So we've made a decision uh, on a supply basis to have more purpose-built rental. It was part of our More Homes, More Choice, our housing supply action plan. Uh, we've been clear in our direction. And the supplementary question. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. And respectfully, back to the minister. Allowing tenants like Rahul and his family to be gouged by their landlord is not protecting them. Rahul just wants an affordable home to raise his young family in. Speaker, his income isn't going up by $400 a month, and his, un and his family is unable to move while his wife recovers from a C-section after recently giving birth to their second child. Rahul told me, and I quote, we had no idea our unit had no rent protections, and we weren't told the unit had no rent control by our landlord when we moved in. If we knew our rent could increase by any amount that our landlord wanted, we would never have chosen to rent here." End quote. He went on to say again, I quote, I wasn't born here, but I didn't think this kind of thing could happen in a country like Canada to my family. When will this government finally accept that its rent control loopholes are unfair, they are unjust, and they are hurting Ontario families like Rahul's? Once again, the Minister of Municipal Affairs. For increasing the supply of purpose-built rental is a priority uh, of our government. We want to ensure that everyone who is a tenant has a safe, secure place to call home. But again, we're not going to go back, Speaker. We're not going to go back. Uh, to the no policies of uh, New Democrats and Liberals. We want to build upon the fact that, again, Speaker, as I said earlier, we have more purpose-built rental in this province since we've seen uh, since 1992. And it doesn't matter what metric you use, Speaker. It doesn't matter whether you look at RBC uh, in terms of their uh, economics, Urban Nation, CMHC, the numbers are there. What do we have to do, Speaker? We have to build upon. Uh, those numbers. We have to, again, work with our partners at the federal and uh, municipal governments to build more housing supply. This isn't a one-and-done policy, Speaker. We made our housing supply action plan, but there is much, much more we can do to increase the supply of housing of all types. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Uh, Speaker, the Milton GO corridor is the third busiest GO transit corridor in the GO system. Tens of thousands of jobs rely on the corridor. Um, by one count, it's 143,000 jobs. Milton is one of the fastest growing communities in the country, and this corridor would provide service to thousands of families who are in need of better transit options. I know that there's been a protracted discussion with CP Rail in order to ensure safe passage of both freight and passenger, tra passenger trains, but my understanding is that those discussions have progressed and that it's now time to take action. On September 14th, the Mississauga called on the federal and provincial governments to work together to complete full-day two-way service to Milton, and this was in response to the August uh, announcement of the federal commitment to fund 50 percent of the cost of delivering this expanded service. In fact, I believe that the federal minister is at Queen's Park today, so, Mr. Speaker, will the government commit Question. to matching federal funding to deliver two-way all-day GO train service every day from Union Station through Mississauga to Milton. To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, it's an important question because we know that the Milton Go corridor is really among the most congested corridors in Ontario, and more needs to be done to ensure safer and more efficient travel. As the population in the region grows, uh, uh, transit needs to grow with it. But, Mr. Speaker, I find the member opposite's question ironic. She and her government had 15 years to make two-way all-day go service to Milton a reality, but they failed to deliver. In fact, Mr. Speaker, in 2014, Mr. Del Duca told members of this House, and I quote, our government has a commitment and will deliver two-way all-day go service to Kitchener-Waterloo, to Milton, to Barrie, and all along the corridors over the next decade. decade. That's our plan, and we'll get it done, unquote, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite is correct. I have a meeting this afternoon with the federal uh, minister of transport to discuss how we can move forward on this. There are uh, commercial negotiations underway. Our government is committed to moving forward with this. We know how important it is, and unlike the previous government, we will get it done. You know, Mr. Speaker, one of the reasons that governments like the previous Conservative government under Mike Harris don't invest in long-term infrastructure projects is that you don't get to cut the ribbon. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, that most of the projects that this government is involved in is going to cut ribbons on were begun under a Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, because under Conservative governments, those projects don't start. So, Mr. Speaker, yes, we had, did not get to the point where we were delivering full-day two-way go service to Milton, because those conversations with CP that I talked about were ongoing, and now they are completed because they were started under a Liberal government. Mr. Speaker, I'm asking the minister, Order. it is not 1916 Order. when what this province did was build roads. It is not the Department of Highways. The Highway 413 is not necessary. What we need is two-way, all-day go service. Will the, will the government commit? to pay its share of the funding to which the federal government has already committed, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. And I thank the member opposite for the question. Um, as she knows, uh, she might not like it, but as she knows, our government unveiled the most ambitious transit expansion plan uh, for the greater Toronto area than any government ever has, with $28.5 million. Dollars. We achieved— we... Stop the clock. I would like to hear the Minister of Transportation answer the question, and I could hear her perhaps if the members of the government side weren't yelling at the same time. The member for Ottawa South is going to come to order. Start the clock. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So we unveiled the most ambitious transit plan in the history of Ontario. Uh, we also know, and the member mentions and is asking about working with the federal government. We understand it's important to work with other levels of government. And in fact, it was our government that achieved a historic partnership with the City of Toronto, York Region, and the federal government to deliver on transit. We are going to continue to work with our partners to deliver value for taxpayers in the province of Ontario and transit, unlike the previous government. In 2015, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Del Duca again told members Response. in this House the Milton Corridor itself will have service every 15 minutes or better during the morning and afternoon peak travel periods. It's another empty promise, Mr. Speaker, by the Liberals. We know how important it is to work with all levels of government. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, and this question is for the Premier. 
Speaker, in this month's fall economic update, the base funding for education was cut by half a billion dollars, down from $31.3 billion in March to $30.8 billion. For families who have seen their kids packed into classrooms like sardines or struggling through hybrid classes that put saving money ahead of learning and support, the fact that this government would be making deep cuts to our community schools is just unconscionable. Can the Premier explain to parents how he can possibly justify cutting half a billion dollars from Ontario schools? Under the government in the fall in the fall economic statement increased investment by 230 million more dollars than we were projected to spend last budget up 600 million dollars year over year as reported by the public accounts it's black and white for every member to see everyone knows that this premier has increased investment every single year the highest level of investment in public education in the history of this province because we believe mm -hmm. in public education a over 1.6 billion dollar investment in covid resources 600 million dollar historic investment to improve air ventilation given the massive repair backlog inherited by the former liberal government we are investing in, in learning recovery 85 million dollars a leading investment focused on uh, early learning uh, on reading as well as mathematics and speaker we're investing more to support tutoring in Ontario to help more students get access Spons. to the reading gaps they deserve we're going to continue to invest in mental health a four times increase and make life better for families for students and for education staff in this province the supplementary question. speaker the minister is spinning so fast he's going to lift off this minister's weak excuses no one is buying them Read, read your own fi fall economic update. Fifth, 500 billion million cut, a half a billion dollars cut. Parents, school boards, education workers, and all our kids have done their very best to make this fall semester work. After 26 weeks of school closures, our kids should be getting more support right now, not less. There is no news in there about the second half of COVID funding to help boards plan for next semester. There is nothing in there on the, on the rapid testing program, which is just confusing and inaccessible. Vaccine rates among eligible youth continue to lag, and the plan for the 5- to 11-year-olds has left, been left to public health units to figure out. Speaker, will the Premier commit today to reversing these planned half a billion dollars in cuts to Question. schools and step up to help address the challenges that they are facing. Yes or no? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we've increased investment last year in the last budget by $600 million year over year. In the most recent fall economic statement, as reported by uh, within our uh, fiscal plan, a $230 million increase of investment when it comes to what we're expected and projected to spend this year. We're investing more than we even anticipated, which is a $600 million increase. We've put $1.6 billion in COVID resources, $85 million in learning recovery. And Mr. Speaker, we've increased for school boards the vehicle by which we provide funding, the grant for students, by an additional $561 million. That couldn't be further from the truth. Investments are up in every measurement. In mental health, something I think all members are committed to, we've increased investment by four times the former Liberal government was investing. We've hired this year alone 1,200 net new teachers, and the hiring continues. 2,000 more staff in school boards right across Ontario reported by the boards themselves. We're committed to safe schools. We're proud that 2 million children are learning within our school system today. Once. We're proud that the ventilation system has been improved in every school. We know there's more work to do with high vaccine rates. We know we can continue to keep kids in. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. A veteran approached me after Remembrance Day ceremonies in Guelph last Thursday. His eyesight has declined, and he desperately needs access to an optometrist. But neither he nor his grandkids can make an appointment for eye care. Speaker, it's wrong that seniors and children cannot access eye care in Ontario. It is wrong that optometrists lose over $30 for each OHIP eye exam. So, Speaker, on behalf of this veteran and thousands of people across Ontario, I'm asking the Premier, will he do basic math and cover the full operating cost of delivering an OHIP eye exam in this province. Minister of Health. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. I can certainly agree with you that it is wrong that people are not receiving the services that they need to receive to receive quality eye care. That includes seniors, that includes people under age 18, but the government of Ontario is ready, willing and able to pay for these OHIP covered services. Sadly, the Ontario Association of Optometrists is not. Now, I think it's very important that anybody who needs eye care should know that the College of Optometrists requires the optometrist, even if they are not providing the care themselves, for someone that needs urgently required health care, the college says that the optometrist must refer them to someone who will provide that service. That is important for everybody to know, to first discuss it with your optometrist and then get a referral to somebody who can help you. However, I think it's also Thoughts? important to say that we are ready, willing and able to sit back at the table at mediation with the association. We've asked them to do so several times. We've made a $39 million payment into their accounts already. We're ready to increase their fees by 8.4%, uh, retroactive to April 1st, and we are ready to sit down and have a working table today, if they're willing to go back to the table, to talk about their overhead costs. We know that they have been put back by previous governments. We want to make it right with optometrists. We want them to come back to the table so that we can continue to provide those services. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Speaker, with all due respect to the minister, I, I ran a small business for many years. You cannot have your business continue if you're losing money on each exam. So yes, the government says they will continue to pay OHIP eye exams, but if you're losing $30 every time you give an exam, how can you continue to do that? The government says we've offered an 8% increase. So that means instead of losing $30, they're losing around $27. It's still not sustainable. And the minister says the government is willing to negotiate. They say it in the House, they said it on social media. So it's my understanding that the OA president has provided the minister through a letter his cell number to begin negotiation. So my question to the minister would be, can the minister inform this House and the people question. of Ontario how many formal outreaches have been made to the OAA through a letter or a phone call asking them to come to the negotiating table since September 1st when services were withdrawn? Thank you. And to reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you very much. I would say the answer is many. Uh, as I mentioned in the letter that I received from the leader of the official opposition and uh, the president of the OAO, they asked me, uh, to, in my capacity as minister, to that you direct the Ministry of Health to immediately commence intensive negotiations with the OAO concerning OHIP optometry fees. Further, the negotiation process must include a mediation and fact-finding process that results in a public report in the event that the parties are unable to reach an agreement. We said yes. We honoured the OAO's request to commence mediation only to have the OAO reject the mediator's terms and walk away from the table. The Ministry of Health has agreed to the conditions required by the mediator to resume no negotiations and is ready, willing and able to continue those discussions with the OAO. But I would say that Response. given the OAO's engagement of legal counsel to support their negotiations and the mediator's regular outreach to counsel to explore the continuation of our talks, the OAO is very well aware. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. I was proud to stand recently with the Leader of the Official Opposition, the MPP, for Hamilton West Ancaster Dundas, councillors from the Missisca Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation, Regional Councillor Dias, ENAP, and many community and environmental voices at Carruthers Marsh in Ajax. We were there to commit to protecting this vitally important area and to adding the Carruthers Creek headwaters to Ontario's Greenbelt when the Ontario NDP formed government in 2022. The Carruthers Creek headwaters are comprised of prime agricultural lands containing sensitive hydrological features, and it is completely surrounded by the Greenbelt. The watershed is vulnerable and invaluable, and we must protect it. The Ontario NDP is committed to protecting the Carruthers Creek headwaters when we form government. However, Speaker, it needs to be protected now. Will this Premier commit to adding the Carruthers Creek headwaters to the Greenbelt? 
to reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. I want to thank the uh, the member for um, her question. Uh, as she knows, from uh, February uh, to April, uh, our government launched a 61-day consultation to grow the green belt, which could lead to its largest expansion since its inception in 2005. Sure. We uh, made a commitment uh, in both the 2020 and the 2021 budgets that we were committed to not just protecting but expanding the green belt as one of our greatest treasures. Um, we are still consulting in terms of urban river valleys uh, and the Periscope Moraine. We'll continue to work with uh, our partners um, on their advice as we move forward. Thank you for the question. Supplementary question. Thank you, and again to the Premier. Talk is cheap with this government. A three-year-old PC party campaign promise made by the now MPP for Ajax and a recent and reactionary damage control Facebook post isn't good enough. The MPP for Ajax has been in Cabinet for the last three years, with the exception of his short but infamous vacation, and yet he still said nothing about this until the NDP raised the issue. He was silent during his time as environment minister and was silent during the government's consultations on expanding the Greenbelt, which recently concluded with absolutely no commitment to adding the Carruthers Creek headwaters to the Greenbelt. Clearly, if this government wanted to protect the Carruthers Creek headwaters, it would have done so. The minister can knock on doors and say whatever he wants, but I can't imagine that that member speaks for the government. Is the MPP for Ajax again going rogue by making environmental commitments or will this government make the right decision and add the Carruthers Creek headwaters to the Green Belt? Thank you. And to apply, the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. A speaker, it's under our Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing that we've launched an expansion of the Green Belt, as he said, potentially the largest expansion in Ontario's history. But, Speaker, we're not done there. We're not done there. Mr. Speaker, some of my first actions as Minister was to expand our green space in the province. We expanded Normandale, uh, Normandale Beach, adding it to Turkey Point Provincial Park. We expanded the Waterfront Trail, an important asset, as that member would know. And we would continue to encourage that member uh, to engage her constituents and constituents throughout the Durham region on important investments that can be made, including a part of our Greenbelt consultations. Speaker, Order. under the previous Minister of Environment, we launched Ontario's Made in in Ontario Environment Plan, which has led to the largest freshwater cleanup of its kind, again important to the Spons. residents of Ajax and Durham. We're going to keep acting on the environment, keep expanding green spaces, and leading uh, to historic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Speaker, we're going to keep doing that, and I'd encourage her to join us in that. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. This house stands in recess until 1 p.m.